Thank you our senior pastor and your entire pastoral team for giving me this platform to share the word of God this morning. I know it's not in many, many areas where a pastor or pastors would leave the platform for a member from the congregation to share the word. Thank you for trusting that I will share the word and that you will not regret at the end of it. Thank you so much. I don't take that for granted. And congregation, good morning. Praise the Lord. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Hallelujah. Mwadhani agosho. Mwami ito minyue. Last no jeso. Now, I thought I wanted to say something. Kongoi mi sing. But then I said Kongoi is not praising Jesus. Eh? <laughs> That's the beauty of being in a, in a cosmopolitan town. Eh? Yeah, because we are of very, very many um, diverse uh, uh, cultural backgrounds. My name is Agnes Mongai. I am born again. I am saved and I serve the Lord in this assembly as an elder. And by the grace of God, I also serve in the greater Sitam fraternity in the council of elders. And I want to thank God for an opportunity to be a member in Sitam Eldorate just to exercise and to participate and to share the life of Christ with the others that God has brought to this community. So I give him all the honor and I give him all the glory. Secondly, I am married. Did I say I am Mrs.? I just said I am Agnes. I am Mrs., I am married, and I'm very particular about that, uh, to a person of the opposite gender. And for sure he's of the opposite gender, and I'm very, very particular, very cautious when I am introducing myself as a married person because happened your Maisha ya metufikisha. So we really have to be very, very specific. Ni wapi hapo tunasema. I happen to have gone to a new uh, working environment. And when I looked at the list of uh, the members there, I was seeing MS. And then I see M-I-S-S. Uh, but me, I said, when they asked me how I want my name to appear there, I really did not understand M-S. I thought I understood M-I-S-S. But I said, me, me, yangu muandike M-R-S. Because me, I think I'm particular about my marital status. Praise the Lord. So when you come, I'll be the, I'm, I'm number two there. It is Mrs., but the others is either MS, MISS, -S, uh, and, and, and I know they have also very sufficient ground to want it like that. I am married to one man. Uh, unfortunately, today we have not come to church with him. He's in Nyandarwa, and he's planting potatoes. Actually, yesterday he was putting fertilizer. Uh, that's what we do in Nyandarwa. It's a land of potatoes, cabbages, carrots. Uh, some maize we do, so he's doing that, and maybe he'll come over this uh, uh, next week. A number of us know him, uh, Mr. Mungai. In between us, we have two uh, children. The Lord has blessed us with the two children, uh, one girl and one boy. And uh, the very two children have blessed us with the three uh, grandchildren, uh, all of them girls, Nakuru County, and we thank God for all those girls. And they are doing very well. So I, I declared that the first one will live to be a governor of a county. And I've declared the second one will live to be a senator of a county. And the third one, who is three months old, will live to be a woman rep somewhere. These are the blessings of the Lord. And they are not labeled. They can be yours. They can also be Mine, praise the Lord. So that is who I am, and I want to thank God for that. 
Now today I was requested to talk about igniting the flame of fellowship. Igniting the flame of uh, fellowship. Last week, Reverend, oh my God, it's not a Reverend, sorry. But we are looking forward to your ordination because I, I named him uh, Reverend Ones, On, Ones for us. Eh? He, he took us through a very exciting introduction to the uh, series that we are going to do this month. And today I'm going to continue from where uh, he left. But before I do that, um, I have something as my introduction. Media, if you could now start rolling the, the, the clips. This is a quote from one author from West Africa, Chinua Achebe. By the way, I should have told you that out there in the market, I am a teacher. I teach language. And in that language, I teach literature, mostly literature of Kiswahili. And in the process of teaching literature, we also read uh, other literature that has been written in English. And um, part of the literature is from West Africa. Chinua Achebe is one of the renowned authors in there. And in his book, Things Fall Apart, he has this quote. A man who calls his kinsmen to a feast does not do so to save them from starving. They all have food in their own homes. When we gather together in the moonlit village ground, it is not because of the moon. Every man can see it in his own compound. We come together because it is good for kinsmen to do so. I'm not sure whether Chinua Achebe was born again at a time when he was writing this book. And even if he was born again, the writing of Chinua Achebe is normally contextualized in the cultural setting of his society. And those uh, Africans of West Africa, just like you and I, though we are in East Africa, but in that context, they are acknowledging the fact that it is good for kinsmen to come together, to come together. And I was like, why is it good for kinsmen to come together? When we come together, you realize, hiya. You, 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 you talk a Nairobi juicy. Hiya. You mean you lost somebody? Oh, 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 you look nice. What have you been eating? And like, oh, sorry, you don't seem to be very nice. Uh, what could be the issues? You discover one another and you get to know how one another is doing. So the essence is not just about eating. You can eat from your home. And it's not just about coming to look at the skies. I can see the moon from my home. But there's something about me that I would want you to see and there's something about you that it will give me an opportunity to see and move me into action. And quite a number of times, that action is meant to lift up that, cult, that society, that group, encourage them, stir them up, bring about you know, the spirit of brotherhood, knit them together for the good of the society. Praise the Lord. So when I, I remembered, when I was at, uh, asking God to help me in my uh, um, uh, sermon preparation, this came to my mind. That indeed, even in our African context, actually, we come together because it is good for kinsmen to do so. It is good for the kinsmen to do so. Praise the Lord. Okay, so I am addressing the topic, reigniting the flame of fellowship. Reigniting the flame of fellowship. Uh, Pastor Kiprop took us through 
reigniting the flame of can we remember I am a teacher we need to link up the previous lesson to the current lesson because we start from the known to the unknown so allow me to start from the known so what did pastor Kiprop remind us last sunday reigniting the flame of okay pastor you may be the one to let us remember reigniting the flame of Mm -hmm. the call, brotherly love, evangelism. We were requested to remember the first love, to reignite. He, he actually gave us a summary of it all, fellowship, evangelism, just to reignite, to call to remembrance and to get into uh, what we, it was felt it has went or gone down. So I'm just picking up part of what he mentioned, and that is reigniting the flame of fellowship. And as I do so, I have this as my sermon outline, medium uh, uh, number three, uh, uh, slide number three. I will do some definitions. I will also talk about the significance of fellowship. I will talk about practicing fellowship. I will talk about effects of neglecting fellowship. I will talk about the challenges of participating in fellowship and their possible solutions. And then thereafter, I will bring this to a conclusion within the stipulated time or the time that I've been given. Okay, reigniting the flame of fellowship. And I am asking myself, what is fellowship? Now this word, English word fellowship, has been translated, or it is an English translation of the Greek word koinonia. Koinonia. I don't know those of you who have been in Bible school, whether that is the accent the word should have or it's supposed, supposed to be koinonia or koinonia. I'm doing it the Kiswahili style where we do emphasis on the second syllable from the end. But whichever way, it's not our word. Eh? Just understand that it is called koinonia. At least that's the spelling. So the word fellowship is an English translation of that Greek word, koinonia. A word that appears in the New Testament. And this word is derived from a root, a root word that means partner or companion. Wherever it has been used in the New Testament, this word koinonia has the idea of to have in common, sharing, and what is the sharing about? Sharing of possessions, sharing of experiences, sharing life, sharing oneself with another, etc. So that is the, 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 the meaning of the root word from which this Greek word koinonia has been derived. Now, when we look at the word koinonia that we are saying has been translated in English to be fellowship. I'm saying here that this word has the concept of being together, being together for mutual benefit. And wherever it is used in the letters of Paul, in the, ex in the ex exhortation of Paul to the churches, to individuals, uh, to cities, it describes a close relationship that Christians have with Jesus. The close relationship that Christians have with the gospel. The close relationship that Christians have with the Holy Spirit. The close relationship that Christians have with the suffering of Jesus 
Christ. And we have the, the, the biblical uh, uh, quotations to that effect. The most priority there is the close relationship that Christians have with Jesus. And the word is close. So close that you can share with him. So close that you can share your life with Jesus Christ. So close that you can have him dictate how your life should be. So close that you have no room to doubt and to doubt his voice when he says, this is the way, follow ye it. You, it is to say, yes, master, and you go that way. Like the men and women in the Old Testament that would not raise a finger. When Abraham and Isaac would be said, told go in this direction, it would be, yes, let's go. So that close is what we are talking about. First with Jesus Christ, the gospel, that is the word of God, the Holy Spirit who is the helper in us, and the suffering of Jesus Christ, because that suffering of Jesus Christ is what now gave us the relationship that we have with him. So that is the concept that is supposed to be brought about by this concept, fellowship. Now, in the New Testament, this word koinonia was a non-optional environment for spiritual growth. There is no way that the believers could ever grow spiritually in the things of God, in their relationship with Jesus Christ, if they did not practice koinonia in the New Testament. So it was non-optional. It was mandatory that as a believer, you had to be in fellowship with one another for spiritual growth. It was not just a matter of you being present, like it is indicated in Hebrews uh, 25, in as much as presence is also critical, it was going beyond an informal social gatherings. You know, like the chamas that we have, it was meant to go beyond that. So it was not just a matter of coming together on specific days, Wednesday prayer meeting, for example, Sunday service, for example, which is good, but the essence was beyond that because we are not always in church on Wednesday. We are not always in church on Sunday. We are all over. We are all over. But in as much as we are all over, this relationship that we have with Jesus Christ and with one another should be permitted in all aspects of our lives. Something that, you know, uh, uh, is being addressed in the book of Hebrew. And according to 1 Corinthians 12, 21 to 27, when you look at how the brethren, how the believers were congregating and doing their koinonia, you will find that it was more about function. It was more about participation. It was more about doing. It was love in action. Because love is also active. It cannot be love if there is no action. Now, our guiding scripture is Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 to 14. And this, our pastor took us through very ably last Sunday. And this is our guiding scripture as I'm saying today. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 to 14. The Bible says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful and believing heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have, to, we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction to the end. 
to the very end. And uh, the words in this scripture portion are very exciting. Because the Christians in the New Testament or in the early church, they were followers of Jesus Christ. And they were male and female. And they are being exhorted here that make sure, see to it, make sure. Hakikisha, in Swahili they say hakikisha. Now I don't know Luya how they say it. The Luya's in the house. What does the Luya Bible say? See to it, we are all English speaking. Thank, thank God we are an English speaking congregation. And the Kalenjins, do you have our attempt for that? See to it. It's like make sure. Ogero. Hio. Kikuyus, now I don't know. Uh, make sure. There are these concepts that you, re you would really want to, to bring it out in the best language that you understand. And it says, see to it, brothers and sisters. Now, it does not say, see to it, you senior pastors, you HOD of various ministries. It does not say, see to it, you category of people. It is the believers. And when it comes to fellowship, the responsibility of seeing to it that none of us has a sinful and believing heart that turns away from the living God are the brothers and the sisters in that particular fellowship. Not the leaders, not the other people with various titles within that fellowship, but as long as you are a brother, as long as you are a sister, we are all sharing in Christ. Christ is our common denominator. Are those mathematics still in schools today? Where it was over, the one that is down. The unifying factor is Christ. So these are the people who have been unified by Christ that are being told, see to it, that none of you has a sinful heart. Meaning that there is a possibility of such a thing happening. Otherwise, if there was no possibility of such a thing happening, the author of this letter would not have said, make sure none has a, an unbelieving uh, spirit. And then encourage us one, I mean, on a daily basis, so long as it is called today. Now, yesterday is gone. We do not have tomorrow. What we have is today. And your today is that where you are, and you are feeling it, and you are there. That is, where, that is your today, and that is our today. So when it is today, when you have this opportunity to make sure that none went away from the faith, the Bible is telling us that is the activity that we need to engage in today. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our conviction to the very end. Fellowship is destined or supposed or aimed at keeping us alive, keeping us to the fact that we share in Jesus Christ and this is supposed to be there every day up to the very end. The Bible says very end, that particular end. When God will tell us, Jesus will tell us, you know, those who watch that hell's, hell's, hell's what, gate and the heavens, you know, welcome my beloved son or my beloved daughter, um, good work that you did there. Before we are told welcome to your rest, we are not going to stop at that. Now, we are a body of Christ because we are spiritually united with Christ and with each other. I've said our unifying factor is Jesus Christ. And since we are members of one another, then we need to relate to each other in a mutually interdependent way. This is fellowship. 
This is koinonia. I want to emphasize that. Since we are members of one another, we need to relate to each other in a mutually interdependent way. I relate with you, you relate with me in the sharing of Christ. And this is what is entailed in fellowship uh, that is koinonia. In the early church, the book of Acts 2 and verse 42, the Bible tells us that the Christians, the believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And in the lives of the early church, or during the days of the early church, the society was very fragmented. Leave alone what we are seeing in the society today. The situation in which the early church was living and exercising their fellowship was very difficult. The, 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 the divided society was such that we had the Gentiles and we had the Jews. And those two never even used to share in anything. We had the men and we had the women. And uh, where they used to meet, we do not know. But what we know, children would be born. But during the day and every cultural life, every day, it was very specific. You are a man, you are a woman. They were slaves and they were masters. And you could tell I am a slave of so and so. So and so is the master of so and so. They were rich people and they were the, the poor people. Talk about the Sadducees, even in spiritual matters, and the Pharisees. So the fragmentation of the society was very, very eminent. And it was actually very difficult how this would come together in a koinonia. No wonder the emphasis on fellowship, that if we are, you know, united in Christ, then we need to share that Christ with one another so that we are doing everything in common. Tell a Gentile and a Jew to live together. That would be something else. Tell women and men to sit together like you are sitting together here. Every category of people had their own places in the society. This is the Gentile place. This is the Jew's place. Women sit here. Men sit there. Masters are here, slaves are there. The rich are in their Milimani residence and the poor are in their Madongoporomoka estate. So how do we come together? And the man of God, Paul, is exhorting them that when we have received Christ, we are one. There is no Jew, there is no Gentile. We can call, partake of the things of Christ together. I can be a, a, a source of blessing to you, even if you are a poor one. You can be a source of blessing to me, and we both of us can go out and be a source of blessing to other one, because the fellowship is supposed to bring glory to God, and when God has been lifted up, he himself will draw men to himself. Praise the Lord. Now, you may be asking me, Elder, Really, what could be the significance of that fellowship? Paul knew that there is significance of being in a, a, a fellowship. One is companionship. Remember, followers of Jesus Christ were not called in to be in isolation. We have not been called to be in isolation out there. When you are alone, you will not make it. We know that iron sharpens iron. We also know that it's not good for a man to be alone, in as much as we normally use that in marriages. But in any other given situation, it is not good to be alone. According to where we have read, being in fellowship is our defense. Because no one, we are supposed to make sure no one drifts back. We are supposed to make sure everybody stands. So when we see that so-and-so is stepping backward, 
there is need to make her come back and say, you cannot go in that direction. You are defended. You come back to the kingdom. Fellowship presents to us a big picture of God. You know you have been gifted in many giftings. You are, you can share the word very well. You can sing very well. You can do this very well. You have this gifting. You can plan. You can execute. These ones we are supposed to come together and to fulfill the purposes of God. Your gift is not meant for you. It is meant for the edification of the fellowship. And so when we are together, we are seeing the big picture of God. How God expresses himself through the gifting that he has given you. And that is quite good. Now, coming in fellowship provides strength. And I've used some words here that are very familiar to us at a time that we are living now. Earth is hard. Dunia ni ngumu. It beats us very thoroughly, mercilessly. My, so when we come, we learn from one another. We share the experiences. We listen to testimonies and we get stronger. In Matthew chapter 18, I've quoted there. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. So when you come and you hear about the experiences of someone else, you will realize, what? You mean you went through that? Ah, uh, I am strengthened. You can move forth. It is a source of encouragement we get in fellowships. In our low moments, fellowship gives us the, the impetus to move forward. Let us consider how we may spur one another, Hebrews says, towards love and good deeds, not giving up in meeting together, as is the habit of some of them, but in encouraging one by one, even as we see the day approach. So that is the essence of fellowship, to keep each other believing. When you come and you will hear so and so, church is happening, then you will know that actually this thing is going on. Mambo ya ukristo hauja haijaisha, ya naendelea. So this thing is, is on. They talk about faith. They say Jesus is still working. Even in your low moments, Jesus is still working. So we are kept on believing. I'm telling us here, fellowship helps us to grow in humility. You know, everything is about Christ and nothing else but Christ. So when you come here, you will be reminded every time you, are, you hear about God working in the lives of people, then you will be reminded of the song that says, Mimi, nipunguke, na wewe, nani ongezeke, mungu. So when you, that song when we sing, and I love that song, worship team, Mimi, Nipunguke, wewe uongezeke. So, unapoimba, una, you know, broken and contrite spirit. That would the Lord acknowledge. And that comes in the fellowship. Now you may ask, Elder, how do we practice fellowship? Is this just coming to church every Sunday? Now the fellowship should focus on what we have have in common. And what we have in common is the new life in Jesus Christ. The disciples had been with Jesus Christ when they saw him do things within the fellowship that they had with them, with, the, with him. And because they knew that there will be a time when Jesus Christ will not be there, they, were, they recorded carefully what Jesus would be doing with them in their various fellowships that they had with Christ. And these are some of the ways that you and I could practice koinonia. So what is coming, when we come to the fellowship, what do we do? We encourage one another. We confess sins to one another. Kwa koinonia, hakuna upekness. Niire ya wazi, eh? We forgive one another. We accept one another. We serve one another. Remember Holy Communion? We serve one another. We build up one another. 
we are hospitable. We understand and recognize our goal. We do many things in the fellowship, in the koinonia. As the disciples of Jesus Christ were able to record and share, and it is written in the book, my, if these are done every time in all aspects of our life, while it is today, we will spur us up in the things of God and it will put our faith up to when he comes. One day there's one of us here who told another lady, tell elder not to go to Western after Sunday service. And I'm like, what has happened? The lady told me, amesema usiende ni kupereke kwake. So I was like, wah, kumeharibika jambo ama na gani. So I went to visit the lady. And when I went to visit the lady, I found her smiling. Then I said, oh, uh, at least nothing is wrong. And two or three more people were there. She served me porridge. She served me gedheri. And she told elder, I didn't want you to go all the way to Western. Hungry? I just felt you should just come under this. She actually served us under some tree. Uh, just to refresh you, elder. And I was like, what? <laughs> you mean some people can that be, uh, be that hospitable, you know? And in that place, someone said, in this a part, a certain community, when you are mean, you are not allocated land along the way, along the highway. So many people are allocated land. Uko chini? Uko chini? By the way, piloti yako iko pande gani? Because if the mean people are allocated land at hapa kwa barabara, they will, everybody who is passing will assume that community is a community of mean people. And that is not the image that the community wants. So I said, ayangu nyandaro at least niko kwa barabara. Those of us who have come to nyandaro, mai niko karibu kwa barabara. God bless us with our plots where we are. That is very good. So these are things that we do and we, you know you make somebody feel nice. That day I really prayed and said, God bless them. And, may, you, and I, may, may we have more and more of these activities that build up the fellowship. Some of us have never known the importance of participating and being part and parcel of a fellowship. We, it is dangerous for neglecting fellowship. One, it is against God's will. The Bible rebukes such. It does not give God the honor. Now you, you are just there and we are here. Or you are just here part and parcel of the fellowship. But you are not partaking of the activities that the disciples have listed in the various letters and the books that they wrote. That is dangerous. It is against God's will. It is a call from God that we do fellowship. It is harmful to our Christian faith because fellowship is supposed to encourage our faith, faith in Christ Jesus. So when you neglect fellowship, it is harmful to your faith. It diminishes God's praise when you neglect fellowship. When we come, this one is sharing this, this one has a hymn, this one has a testimony, this one has an experience to, pray, to, 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 to give and to share. And at the end of the fellowship, everyone is saying, Tukute, tendere, saye, yesu. Yani mulisa hao, mulipotoka hayo makanisa, mwezi kuimbako kawimbo. You know, when we come to the fellowship, at the end of the fellowship, that should just come out. And you are praising God. So you can imagine when you neglect. And we are diminishing the God, I mean God's praise. He inhabits in the praise of his people. But take care again, he says, if you do not praise me, he is capable of lifting the... It confuses other Christians and non-believers out there. On Sunday morning, sasa wendo mamo metoa tu murundo wanguo. Nakarai hapa, nakarai hapa, nakarai hapa. Mpaka yula mbaya haendi kanisa nakuliza, eh, mama junior, today you are not going to church. You know, because she thought you belong to a fellowship somewhere. And today, nalikuona jana. You should have watched the clothes yesterday. And then they get confused. It obstructs true piety. 
you know, because you know you will worn away. Actually, like what I'm saying there at the end, it is a step down to apostasy. Apostasy is going back. It is rebelling, going back into the world. And the Bible says it is dangerous for them that knew the Lord and they rebel and go back. You become worse. How many times? Seven. Than you were. So it is dangerous. We better just keep to the fellowship so long as you are a believer. You may ask me, Elder, I really want to be in the fellowship. Unfortunately, I am having challenges. So I am briefly going to look at the challenges of being actively involved in the fellowship of believers. And as I tackle a few of them, I will be giving some possible solutions. We have new trends, church, and one of them is this thing that is called relativism. Relativism. At least my kiku is not affecting my R and L. Relativism. Now, relativism is uh, an aspect of one's opinion over another. We are living in a time when it is no longer, uh, people no longer say this is good. Good is relative. Wrong is relative. Right is relative. You cannot tell somebody you are wrong. Atakwambia kwani? Utadu? You know? So, and then you will tell me, Elder, I tried, but people, you, in fact, you even fear telling somebody that this is wrong because atakwambia, to me it's not wrong. It is right. But we are saying here, we need to constantly ask ourselves what the word of God says in every situation and abide by it. Not about what I know as being good. What I know as being good to me may be contrary to what the scriptures are saying. There's this other thing of privatization. What I do is my private business. Keep off. So you can't even come for Bible study in my house. And people are giving apologies. Sorry, I will not be there. Sorry, I will not be there. Why? To them, this is my private life. Why should they come, you know, to my house and such like? The Bible encourages us to confess our sins to one another. I'm wondering how your private life will come in, in koinonia. Our core values, we have accountability to God, to one another. Integrity. That which you do when no one is watching. When no one is listening. I am very far away from uh, 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 this assembly. I work quite away. What do I do when I know that uh, there is no possibility of bumping into Elder Laktabai in Bungoma town, for example? You know? So that one hinders our being actively engaged in a uh, uh, fellowship. But we are saying like Sitam Fraternity, we have core values. Let's stick to our core values. Accountability, integrity, transformation. They will steer us up into remaining in the fellowship. Individualism. Those words of me, I and myself. Ma, you cannot get me. We hear the slogans of my dress, my choice, my body, my choice, my reproductive, whatever, whatever, my choice. I will choose when to end the pregnancy. I will choose what to wear. I will choose what to do with my body. It is my right. And we are bringing in it into the fellowship. It is contrary to our Christian call that we need to bow to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I want to declare to us the clarion call should be my life, God's choice. Because Christ is our unifying factor. Not what I feel I should, not what I read, not what I see in the Facebook, in the social media. We need to ask ourselves, does it bow to the Lordship of Christ? Hallelujah. Our associations, brothers and sisters, be careful with whom you have koinonia with. 
Second Corinthians six fourteen warns us not to be equally yoked with non-believers. I mean, un, un, unbelievers or non-believers. Light and darkness do not have fellowship. Light and darkness do not have koinonia. Some people will say, I will get married to a non-believer, and then in week one, week two, nitamulete kanisani. Ladies who are here and you are not married, if he is not born again, please let him pass by. The Lord will visit you at his own time. We have seen ladies, when they go that direction, they go down to apostasy. People have said they are now going to be evangelists in some very, very dangerous places, and they do not want to heed to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And before you know it, they have already succumbed to the fall. So we really need to be careful with who is your friend. Who is your friend? We are talking about burnouts in our fellowship. Research has shown that 20% of members of particular fellowships are active. The 80%, they just come and sit. Ushering team could only be about 10. I don't know whether there are even 10 in our uh, fellowship. We are 1,200. In this 1,200, 10 are ushers. You saw the worship team, we could count them. Are they more than 10? Mm, maybe. And every time we hear, uh, is there anyone who can play the keyboard? Anyone who can play the piano and so on so, and so forth? We even do ministry fairs just to bring people to see that they can do many things in the fellowship. Tunayaka matens hapo ya Sunday school, tunayaka balloon, tunayaka red carpet, tunayaka toys. Just to see whether it will ring a bell in you that you can come and, uh, uh, you know, participate in the fellowship. And then when they come to give the report of the uh, ministry fair, we only recruited two teachers. And those two teachers, no male was among them. And we are like, out of the 1,200, we could only do this. Very insensitive to the need to participate. Yesterday or the other day I saw in the social media was someone saying, you, you, you are so dead. It's like you are, you are competing with the dead and you expect to make it in the land of the living. I said, wow, people can have quotes. You know, something does not start you up into action. And then those who are now active, they, they suffer, burn out. So we are saying here that since this is the reality that we are living in, as we wait for the Lord to bring them to ministry, let the leadership come out uh, with a mechanism in which maybe you can give them rest a bit, we can uh, uh, take them to some recess kidogo, we can pat on them on their backs just to encourage them so that they don't suffer burnouts. Conflicts are bound to happen, ladies and gentlemen. It's only John who was in the island of Patmos who was on his own without any person and he could see the new Jerusalem. But as long as we are uh, people in a community together, we are bound to rub shoulders. Conflicts are, can happen because again, I'm saying here, koinonia does not happen in isolation. So in the course of participating in the fellowship, Conflicts may happen. And so in the leadership, we are saying this calls for effective conflict resolution mechanism. We, are, we have consumer Christians, people who want to come and just to hear what the Lord has for them, and they go out. We are saying, can we hear and understand the invitation to join Christ in what he is already doing? We are called into uh, activity into mission that already Jesus Christ is doing. As a conclusion, brothers and sisters, we are a body of Christ because we are spiritually united with him and with each other. Since we are members of one another, we need to relate to each other in a mutually interdependent way, which I said is the koinonia, a fellowship with him 
that does away with the differences that divide us and makes us one in him. This is a call to get back to fellowship. This is a call to get back to koinonia. Senior pastor, thank you.